a story about what happens to me with a policeman, and that's it. It's not not events there of protest. It's not uh, um, it's not asking for donation to the group. I'm really it's sorry, Lira. Uh, I'm sorry. It's I'm gonna stop for one second. Uh, I see a lot of people having issues in the chat. Um, I personally can hear you fine, but if the entire rest of the debate does have issues, we might have to. Uh, start over real quick. Is everybody having issues with understanding what is being said or has it been solved? I, I personally, um, I hear lots of echo. So like oh, the okay. sound reverberates and so it's very hard to uh, to hear. Is there somebody who is not muted maybe? I don't think so. I'm, yeah, I'm I was not. having some issues as well, but um, I mean, I could fill in the gaps fine. All so right. I wouldn't- of, yeah. As long as like rest of the panel, are you good? Okay, cool. Then we're just going to continue from the point they actually... stopped or from the beginning. Uh, you can just, I think, where you can restart because uh, I was getting a lot of it from the beginning of your speech already uh, that people couldn't hear it. So, so restart. Go right ahead. The... Yeah, that's yeah. fine. It was one minute anyway. So go ahead. Cool. Okay. <laughs> so um, I will start in three, two, one, and go. Pana, the social movements are just addicted to popularity of likes and shares and things that are written about them in the social media. They are addicted to just people talking about their ideas, sharing their opinions, instead of what they did history, which is to actually do some action in order to change things in society. We totally regret for that because we think that instead of focusing on what actually changes the behavior of people and policies, they are just focusing on expressions and popularity in the media. And I'm going to analyze you why we're, uh, why we're regretting because it's less actionable in making people actually act in the goals of these social movements. Before that, I'll explain what are we talking about in this today. So when you're, we are saying publicity and performative expression, we're saying that people things that the people write posts and shares and hashtags about stories and things that happen to them. They don't ask for an action, they don't share an event of a protest or thing like that, just express things that happen to them and want to get this popularity in shares. Thinking at the same time, it's extremely expensive in the status quo. It's things like a feminist woman that tells a story about men who just ask her um, who she is and, uh, and gave her some, uh, told her something about what she wears. And then uh, she writes it on Facebook and gets a lot of shit. Things like BLM movement that tells a story about a story what happened to an individual with a policeman instead of telling people to go to protests, to contribute to the cause and things like that. We think that the comparative here, the thing that was in all the history of social movement and stopped in recently when we moved to the social media world, is, the, is to ask for contributions, is to, to ask to join a petition, to actually do something, is to um, uh, publish an event and brochures like once it was to be able to do something. We think that this comparative is much better, I'm going to analyze it in my eyes. So let's move to why it's more, much more actionable in making advocates actually act on something. So first we need to characterize which world we're talking about today what, and what will happen if we didn't have it in the first place. We're talking about the media world. There are two things that are really important when we're talking about media. The first one is media is a huge echo chamber, which means that the algorithm of the media, of Facebook, Twitter, and every other media, just make you see the opinions of people that think like you. They are doing so because they want you to enjoy the time when you're spending in the social media in order to buy more things in the advertisement they publish in these pages. They don't want you to be angry and see other opinions. Therefore, just all of their algorithms make it really nice for you to see your opinions again and again and again. The second thing which is important is ideas passing through social media make uh, groups of people join to specific ideas. When I see many of my friends that things are like doing something and they uh, see uh, more and more friends that are doing that, sharing that and things like that, it's much more likely that I'm going to share it too, that I'm going to join that too. Now, what is the problem that we're facing in the status quo which we want to solve? We think that the opinions that people are sharing just for their opinions, like the story as I said in my friend, are two things. First, we think they are extremely emotional. We try to just make people feel emotional, feel that they are part of something, and, 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 and touch their emotions. And because of that, the second thing that happens is that's pretty much radical. It seems like they're trying to go against everything and say that uh, these uh, things are pretty radical. You know, why these things just doesn't work in making people actually do something and not only sharing and, and things like that. So first of all, we think it's about knowledge. Opposition may say, no, but it's good because now people can share and read it and they know what the problems are. But as I just explained, the echo chamber of these social media makes it really unlikely that they don't know it already. In most of the cases, the, the people that read this, uh, these things have the same ideas in the first place and it actually doesn't change anything about their knowledge of the problem at all. So 
uh, the second, even if they are uh, exposed to um, the other side's opinions, they're most likely going to see the comments of their friends saying that it's fake news and it's not real, and most likely believe the comments and not these opinions in the first place. So the knowledge is not a problem here. Second, you think what the actions they're trying to do, when I see my friend all talking about in idea, I don't actually know what to do with that. The minute problem, the action that I do is to do a like or share or comment on this thing. I think that the, when I do this like, I feel like I did my cause, I did my duty. When this is a story, I think, oh, I totally agree with this idea, let's share it so other people will see. Once I share it, I feel like I'm the best man in the world that I share this really important idea. I think that if the people, when the people that see it already know these problems, and most of them probably believe it already, we think that this action actually don't do anything good in the world, and I feel much better now, I don't need to go about the problems. I don't need to do anything because I feel my duty already. And, and the third thing, we think that the oppositions of these ideas use it for hijacking. We're taking, they're taking these emotional and radical stories and try to show that first they are fake news, you shouldn't believe it's not the truth, you should fight even harder because of this thing. Secondly, they take it out of context and they think, oh, they don't tell you all the stories, they add some facts that are probably true and probably not. And, and it just convinces them to fight back. What is the comparative here we are talking about? You think? The comparative is the people who call for action, call for signing a petition, to go to a protest and share an event, to contribute to social lobby and social movements and things like that. Why we think it's extremely likely that this is the comparative? Because think historically, before the social media, this is how all, of all the social movements acted. They had brochures and every advertisement of protests and things like that. We think that for some reason, when social media entered, people stopped believing in that and started saying, okay, now I can express myself much better. I have a new way of expression, and now telling these stories will do the best thing. And they just left the thing that happened before and just invented something new. We think that if we if we didn't have that, it's much likely that we would have been continued the history and continue to act like they did before in events, in, in asking for contribution. Before I continue, second half. If victims of oppression feel it is empowering to share stories of what happened to them, why shouldn't they do that? So we think even if it's empowering and you will analyze that probably, we just think it's much less important than actually do something with that. If they feel a little better because of empowerment, it, act, it doesn't change the problem that caused them to feel discriminated, because them these things. We think it's much more important for the social movement to actually make a change. It's for A, to get more money and contribution to the social movement in order for them to be able to put some lobbies on the politicians and fight for changing the regulation and changing the rights. It's things like a, a, a making protests with a lot of people, which make politicians see that the public view is changing and is now towards something specifically and now change the way they behave. We think it's petitions that now we can show to politicians and show that the public thing has changed. We think it's specifically if, if, uh, if this process didn't happen and they would have continued to try to do these things, we think that the popularity of social media would be great in making it much, much bigger than you see in the status quo. We think, we think it's because people want to be like your friends, they want to be like people that are around them and, and they try to uh, and copy the things that they see with your friends. If instead of just writing expressions, people would actually tell them actions that they should have do, would have, we would have seen much more people protest, much more people contribution, and the social movement would actually do something. For these reasons, I beg you to propose. Thank you so much for that speech. And now I'd like to give the floor to the leader of opposition. Here, here. Okay, so just. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Three, two, one. One of the ways in which social movements can actually create change, right? So I think when you try to engage change in a political system, the only incentive of politicians to ever listen to you are twofold. Number one, the scale of support that you're likely going to have. And number two, the intensity of that support that affects whether or not something is actually going to become a voting issue, whether or not enough people care about that issue and whether or not they care enough about that issue to actually change how they vote 
based on it, right? Because these are the things that are likely going to affect their chances at re-election. I'm going to prove to you why we get both of those things. And it really doesn't matter if individuals are able to formulate policies themselves, right? Because to the extent they feel like something they like in status quo needs to change, they have strong ideologies and opinions about that. I think governments are incentivized to propose policies that ameliorate those sentiments, right? That solves that dis dissatisfaction that people have. So people, for example, maybe are pissed off with immigration policy. They don't need to propose a specific policy platform about how to solve that immigration, right? They just need to say like, I am dissatisfied with how immigration is going now and governments are incentivized to give a policy on how to better ameliorate those problems, right? A couple of responses to like, a response mostly to opening government. I don't think they have a case because I think they're deeply confused about what the counterfactual actually is, right? Mostly we can still do things like get people to protest and donate because those are expressions of your like stance and ideologies and beliefs and opinions, right? Note that it's about what you put on the pamphlet, right? How you get people to actually protest and like donate, right? Because, you know, on our side, we say like, ah, it's because we are pissed off, right? It's because all our life experiences mean that something needs to change, that the system is broken, really strong rhetorical stances. And I, I, I suppose on their side, just like I, they didn't even propose a counterfactual about how they actually get people to come forward, right? Like, what are they signing a petition for? Like, supposedly, and like, I'm, I'm just gonna create what the counterfactual actually probably is. It's probably things like statistics and proposing a policy platform, right? For example, saying 80% of African Americans living in the US today are targeted by police brutality. Here's a specific policy platform about how we change that. And that's why you need to come out and protest and donate, right? So on our side, we say like, we need to change things because the emotional, ideological stances, they probably are much more numerical and factual, right? So going like, so a lot of that cases, therefore is not mutually exclusive. They need to propose an actual counterfactual, right? So number one, talking about why does it get more people joining the social movements on our side of the house? Number two, why we get good policy the outcomes on our side. So number one, about why that it gets more people joining social movements, right? Let me characterize what our site actually looks like. It looks like headlines about strong quotes that activists are giving, right? That portray their stances, opinions, or beliefs. They're highly rhetorical, highly emotive, and highly, ide highly ideological, right? So why do people respond to that? Four tiers as to why. A, accessibility, right? Now that this is the spokesperson coming out, talking about their life experiences, which is highly rhetorical, I think may, like many people who, for example, come from unprivileged backgrounds the very people that we're trying to help on our side of that house actually like are better able to access this kind of activism right because they don't necessarily need to for example be highly educated about how to understand statistics or how to critique things like policy platforms right so since many movements fight for the underprivileged that are blocked from things like education that are blocked from things like for example the ability to heavily criti criticize things like statistics and numbers I think on their side of the house they cannot engage with that mode of activism because they perceive it to be not only incomprehensible, but incredibly elitist to the extent that it's the same thing that the school systems try to indoctrinate them with, right? I don't think on our side, you don't need to be an expert to be a valid member of a social movement. What you need to have is very strong opinions about something, very strong expressions of what you feel. So I think loads of people, especially who come from disprivileged backgrounds, who experience these things firsthand, have those strong experiences, right? Because their life experiences are shaped by this and therefore are more likely able to access a movement and more likely to join it. Second tier, about just like cathartic and community. Look, like if you're, a, if you're a minority who is affected by things like police brutality, it's impossible for you to be emotionally normal factual when you, you and your family have been affected by an issue, right? The demand that you, for example, remove yourself and just talk about objective facts is completely impossible to the extent you've been incredibly traumatized by the life experiences you've had. What you want is to express those life experiences and to have them validated by other people, right? So on our side, I think the, 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 the desire for you to be expressive about that is positive to, for most people because they feel a sense of community, which is why they join movements in the first place, right? They can have their life experiences validated by other people and know that they are not alone. Furthermore, on their side, you're, acting, you're adding an extra burden for you to restrain yourself, which is far more burdensome for, than being expressive because most people affected by this have those traumatizing life experiences. Third tier, I think we get much more attention in media headlines, right? This is where we make it asymmetric to OG, who just says you only reach the people who already know an issue. Do loads of people just don't know that Black Lives Matter actually has a legit point. This is where we reach mainstream media that has a wide reach, including people that didn't know why an issue was a problem in the first place, right? There are media incentives to pick up things like strong quotes and strong statements, strong emotions, because those things are sexy, right? Those things sell papers. Those things get you airways and airtime and more traffic to things like your websites, right? I think on the comparative, when you just have, for example, statistics that say 70% of people experience a problem, here's a policy to support it. It's incredibly dry and you just don't get that media traffic that you want. 
one. So media media has no incentives to pick something like that up. On our side of the house, we have a much wider reach in people because we get those media headlines, which means that even if it is polarizing, that i.e. like those strong emotions polarize people, it doesn't matter, right? Because we reach 10,000 people. And even if we've polarized 50%, we still got, got 50, like 50, the other 50%, 5,000 people that wouldn't have joined us otherwise because they just weren't aware of the issue in the first place, right? So final tier, right? People need to understand the severity and urgency of an issue, which means that you need to make it visceral to them, right? So you can tell them statistics and facts, but those things are abstract and hard to picture as an individual, especially if you're a moderate who has never experienced this issue in the first place. You need to understand the real human consequences of that. So I think you can only communicate this when individuals strongly expressing their emotions, how traumatized and sad they were, how it affected them, and just like, therefore, what is why they feel strongly about it. Because I think people are, in, are emotionally empathetic and are naturally social animals, right? When we see someone being passionate, we instinctively try to understand what provokes such strong emotions, therefore drives us to understand where they are coming from and understand the issue and also reciprocate that emotion, right? To get just as upset as they are because it is true. It would be terrible if I was in that position, right? So this means both these scale increases as well as the sincerity of the like sincerity of people's feelings about that issue, which means that you get electoral change. So why do we get hard policy outcomes? Again, I told you that politicians just need to respond to that sentiment that people have on the ground, right? So they can propose policy on their side of the house. I think we have effective checks and balances that ensure that this policy is at least effective, right? People at the top of the social movement probably care about the efficacy of policy and are able to criticize it if it's not good, as well as experts that commented in media. Once you get wider reach with people, more people are able to hold those policies accountable to actually delivering consequences. Because of all of what I've said, oh, oh, takes this debate. Thank you very much for that speech. And now I go to the Deputy Prime Minister. Here, here. Am I audible? Yes. Great. I will begin in three, two, one. Look, it is not enough to tell me that I will access more people from opposition side. The real questions of this debate are A, where we are actually convincing to more people, and B, where we are actually translating that, those people into taking action. I think that once we show you that when the threshold for participating in a social activist movement becomes lower, then the competition on the kind of messaging becomes such that you lose out on the actual convincing nuanced messages in a way that creates a situation that people are less likely to actually change their voting patterns or lead to action. Let's see exactly how this happens. All of my things will be directly clashing with OO, but I will try and flag them as I go along. Look. What happens in status quo is in, in, a, in a question of who exactly is doing the messaging. The question is anyone, because of the ability to express your opinion has become so easy because there is no expectation on you to translate your opinion into further action. There is no expectation on you to later on actually write to your representatives or actually organize a protest or actually do any of the research or any of the active things that anyone can just post anything on Facebook. Anyone can use Twitter hashtags. Anyone has the ability to create something popular and anyone has the ability to represent a movement if they so choose. But let's talk about exactly what becomes popular on media, right? Because notice that OO agree with me that media is a big issue here and that media is attracted to things that are strong in the motive. But what exactly is it that they are attracted to? They are attracted to things that create traffic. When we're talking about platforms like social media, any kind of react creates traffic. Notice that that is both positive reacts, but also negative reacts and things that are negatively correlated with this kind of uh, expression. We're talking about shares, both in support and in rebuke, and we're talking about comments, arguments, and disagreements. This means that the things that are more likely to create comments that people get so mad about that they react to it and comment on it and create arguments, arguments that are likely to get out of control and create things that are aggressive and conversation that is aggressive because the people participating in it have such strong opinions, like oh, oh, think they do, these are the kinds of things that get promoted, and these are the kinds of things that steal the limited amount of media attention that exists, and these are the kinds of things that therefore end up representing the social movement. This means that these are the more radical and controversial ideas, more shallow and less nuanced ideas, which means that the ideas themselves are less convincing, but also the understanding of the ideas at the end of the day is less convincing because if even if people are reading literally everything that is said, being said about, I don't know, 
feminism, they're not going to be able to retain all of the nuanced information. They're going to be reading radical things and the average is going to end up being something shallow and unnuanced because they are being uh, presented things that are shallow and unnuanced. This kind of competition means that you are getting media attention focused only on these kinds of things because they are easier to understand. They are more shallow and they are, in OO's words, sexier. And you're getting those only those ideas. What is the comparative? Look, when activism isn't just about being performative, but also the norm is not to act and do things, it requires effort. It requires that you also translate that into organizing events and being convincing. It means that you have to phrase and write letters and find out how to send them to your local representatives. It means that you are actively trying to meet with these local representatives and lead to policy change. You are creating these petitions. You are researching how laws and things need to work. When that is the norm and the emphasis is on doing those things, the threshold for representing a movement becomes higher and you need to be able to phrase yourself in a more convincing way and you need to do more research you need to know facts and you need to know what is possible. No, this isn't actually mutually exclusive to being a motive. We think that people who are likely to put in the effort to do all of these things are people who have a strong emotional connection to this subject. That is to the extent that they are willing to put in the effort to try and actually change the things. This means that they are likely to also be able to emotionally connect and also phrase their words and ideas in a way that is emotional to people and, and draws upon their own personal experience. But this means that the expectation from that is also to research and actually present the things in a factual way and in a way that explains how they can take action. This doesn't mean they have to suggest the direct policy. This just means that they have to suggest doing something and research how to do this and not just be performative for the sake of being performative. We think that these people who still feel strongly will still be doing these things and will be representing this movement. But we think that people who are exposed to these ideas, who are both convincing and actually telling me what I can do and should be doing in order to further my cause, and uh, in order to further my cause, are uh, uh, so the people who are exposed to it are more likely to be convinced. Why do we think that even, we think that an additional reason why people are less likely to be convinced if they are exposed to the radical things is A, they are easier to answer and the kind of conversation is just like, no, look, people are just being emotional and, and, and exaggerating and this isn't a big deal. For example, I am in a Facebook group that says uh, the audacity of this man, it's a tagging group, and every time a woman puts up a screenshot of someone asking her how her how are you doing and she decides that this is a sexual assault on her thing this is the kind of thing that is radical and creates sexy things and people rebuke and go out against and this is the kind of thing that ends up representing everyone in the very very and creates the stereotype of man hating feminist which is what we are trying to avoid on our side look even if people are exposed to both sides of arguments this is still harmful because hearing plausible explanations that argue against just causes, against people who are unable to defend their cause properly because they are emotional, because they are strongly opinionated, and because they are exactly the people who didn't take the time to think through uh, to think through the things that just like are performative, that is when those arguments become convincing and people might say, well, I need to take a POI, so I'll take you opening. Yeah, so we, we live in an age of sensationalism and populism. Why are people incentivized to engage with your nuance and deep facts? I think that is exactly what I'm trying to prevent on my side, is the emphasis isn't on performance, but on the people who put in the effort to actually take action. That is when, the, that is like, I don't know if we can, but like the motion is I believe it would be better if we did, right? I think that the emphasis should be on the people taking action who are better able to represent their arguments and be nuanced and be convincing. Look, even if people are exposed to both sides of things, it leads people to generalize more. It means that like, even if I am exposed to the activism, but I'm also exposed to the counter arguments, notice that the people lose out are the people who are calling for active action because being passive and being not convinced enough to do things or change things is exactly the thing that hurts my cause. How would our comparative lead to actual change? First of all, those who are exposed are more likely to be convinced, therefore they are more likely to actually take action. Those who are convinced are more likely to take action because they know what action they are being asked to take instead of just page hosting a Facebook thing. The kind of action it creates is like petitioning for policy change and not a band-aid effect of I shared so I did my part. And also we just think that with the lack of competition, the media will shift to actual things things that call for action and will focus more on the people who are able to represent the argument better. Because we are preventing this competition of representation and we're getting the best representation for our cause, we think we end up with the best, you know, yes, you can stop writing. Please propose. Thank you very much for that speech. Now we go to the Deputy Leader of Opposition. Here, here. Uh, 
um, and nice and audible. social movements did not create the age of sensationalism and populism. That would be there on their side of the house as well. The question to answer in this debate is who is better likely to survive in that context? Where are social movements more successful? I'm going to do three things. I'm going to talk about the societal mindset and what will otherwise be and why that sort of publicity is necessary. Secondly, where we get more mobilization and why we should care about that the most. And thirdly, on policy outcomes, why do we also get that better? Let's talk about the societal mindset. What would it otherwise be? Why this is necessary? The reason why this argument will matter is that opening government wants to only ask people for donations without stories, assuming that people already know all the information. If I'm going to prove that people do not already know, opening government will be asking them for donations for an issue that they don't know about. I have a suspicion that they won't donate that much money. Reasons as to why people do not care. Number one, there is a rising apathy into looking into issues. Like economic status, especially of majority groups, is actively increasing, meaning that people tend to be more kind of content with the base they have, less likely to be even interested into looking into issues. Number two, there are already massive incentives of political parties, governments, and media to not advertise a lot of social issues, right? This is because like, it would turn your voter base away. The reason why parties do not talk about race issues or LGBTQ issues is because they don't want to anger their like, kind of conservative basis or the kind of centrist Democrats. Because of that, that also applies to economic issues as well. The way this manifests, it's for example, through education, like omitting things in curriculum, which is like, which are crafted by legislators or like just not exposing these things in media. The reason why this matters is that people are generally unaware unless you shove it in their faces. And given that government doesn't have the incentive to do that, social movements are in the unique position to do it. The implication is that it's better to have something that is shallow and unnuanced because it's ultimately better than the comparative of having nothing. Know that they just asserted people know it. Even if you find that intuitive, I gave you structural reasons you have to go with our characterization. Second, on mobilization. First thing I would posit is that mobilization and the broad amount of people in your movement is something that you should look at primarily. The reason is that even if they are correct, that they will have like for some reasons, like number of petitions, again, unclear what their people will be donating for. But if they have some more petitions, they will be coming from less people. Know that even if you go, if like four or five people or 10 people send like message email to like that MP or whatever, they will not make any legislative react, right? Because it, insofar as you care about re-election, if you do not have the critical mass of mobilized people, no one gives a shit about whether you send one email or not. Chokan gives you many mechanisms as to why we get more mobilization. And I would just note that opening government agrees with most of these. Given that, I think closing government has to oppose it altogether and oppose mobilization in general. Well, first mechanism, people join movements in order to self-express. You want something to identify with, to base your identity on, right? You want to find community with common goals, way to social and just feel like you are a part of something. I would also note that it structurally proves why this is just not something that takes place on social media, right? Expression of belief is likely to happen in real life because you have much more experience with that catharsis when you go out and protest with all those people. Even if it's maybe performative or whatever, you still get this catharsis from it. We think that's still good because you are showing the critical mass. And the reason why this matters is also that you have just lower bar to join in, right? You don't have to deal with the hard data. Not opening government agrees with this. So again, we are the ones who are actually creating bigger mass that you can see on the square, the bigger mass that the politicians have to pay attention to. Second on empathy and this reality, right? We tell you that people just generally do not have any incentive to care about statistics. This is just a number that you do not necessarily have to engage with. It's something that you can't necessarily imagine how it looks like. Now you're going to see something that is visceral. So one, you're going to feel the compulsion to alleviate pain that people generally do feel when they see someone suffering. But two, you just rely emotionally, right? Like you can empathize with the pain that the person is expressing. You can't do that with statistics. Opening government says like, ah, it's going to be easy to dismiss because like you are overly emotional. You need to judge this debate comparatively, meaning that you're much more easier to dismiss like hard statistics over something that touches your emotion. 
Thirdly, you have the ability to include minorities better. Know that if you are oppressed, you very often are unable to express yourself in like the hard data and stats. The reason why this matters is A, you are taking away the opportunities of minorities to actually express the way they feel. But secondly, this means that like very often majority people and privileged people are prioritized to be spokespeople of movements because like men just look more rational. And if you want to present hard data, it's better to have a man do it, right? Because of that, it often means that movements are hijacked, movements are like watered down because you have like men Men and like the privileged group as spokespeople crowding out the minorities, incredibly important. But like fourthly, and again, they agree with this, you're going to be more in media with strong quotes, right? Media wants to be sensational. You're going to be portrayed. OG agrees. Know that for all those reasons, we're just going to have higher critical mass. Note that we are explaining to you why mobilization matters significantly more than maybe have like very small group of slightly more committed people. How are we then getting policy outcome as well? And before I go on to that, I would like to take closing government. What's the conversion rate between a like and a dollar in donations? Uh, so like one, I do think that like you can like and also donate in, in, in so far as like the emotion, like the, the emotional response often compulses you to do something. I don't think those are things that like necessarily are exclusive. Second, we explained but on your side, you are unlikely to get those donations either given that people do not know what they're donating for and you are presenting them things that are less likely to even make them act. Secondly, then, like irrespective of likes, how are we getting the policy outcome, even if people are just liking posts in our worst case scenario? Number one, you are getting wider reach, meaning that politicians are now incentivized to pander to you. Note that you are realizing that like the, the, that the issue that you are representing with many people sharing it, many people turning out to like your protests at the square, means that this might start mattering as a swing issue in elections. What this means is that very often all parties start, have to start to see you as a voting bloc, Parties are now pressured and, and forced to express their opinions on the issue. You no longer can just hide yourself from commenting, for example, on LGBT issues. The reason why this matters is that like, even if you don't craft your policy, the politicians will craft the policy for you because they want to pander to you, meaning that they are going to like present their policy ideas in order to get you to vote for them. Secondly, you still have people at the top like advisors or like people who just like in organizational ways still craft policies and can go lobbying, right? We don't have to oppose policy crafting altogether. Like you can still, um, you can just focus on publicity in general with the messaging of the movement. You can still have people on the top who are doing who are doing the, the, the lobbying on the behalf. Lastly, would also posit that there's going to be more catharsis for many people who are, uh, for many of the minorities or people who are directly oppressed by the issue you are, you are focusing on, because now when they see a majority massively like arguing in your favor, you're much more likely to then go and do like, other ways of, 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 of lobbying on your own. Given all those reasons, you are much more likely to get mobilization on our side of the house. You're much more likely to get policy outcomes. I think this is necessary insofar as otherwise you will just have apathy in general. For all those reasons, opening up.